This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. A month or so ago I did a two-part study on the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, wanting us to understand that God has all the power He's ever had. The issue is not, can God give men today and women today miraculous gifts? The issue is, has He will to do it? And the answer is no. And I showed you from Scripture that these gifts were not permanent. They were always meant to cease when the New Testament was completed because that Word would furnish us the things that those miraculous gifts supplied other than the healings and such things. And of course we can pray to God for that if, and uh, we're taught to do that. But uh, now I want to talk a little bit this morning about the, the uh, indwelling and the operation of the Spirit. Does the Spirit dwell in us? If He dwells in us, how? And if He dwells in us, how does He operate today? Does He operate separate and apart from this Word or in connection with this Word? You see, that's very important too. And so I want to study that out with you and give you some material on it again and make sure that we all have a good understanding of these things because we can get carried away, folks, by error and false doctrine. We just can't. And many, many people are, and there's no need in that if we'll stay knowledgeable of God's Word and stay true to the Word. Let's introduce the thoughts today there on the front below the title from Acts 2.38, where on the day of Pentecost the Bible says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter commanded the Jews that day to repent and to be baptized. He promised them the remission or the forgiveness of their sins, and He promised them secondly that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the question arises, what is the gift of the Spirit? What's Peter talking about here? What was promised to them? That's one of the things that we'll talk about during the course of the study this morning. Now, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit dwells in every Christian. I don't want anyone to mistake that. If you're a child of God this morning, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And the Scriptures are just abundant on this. There are just so many places that this is taught. I want you to read with me now this second page in and notice the following Scriptures regarding this indwelling. First from Acts 5 and 32, we learn the Spirit is given to all that obey the Lord. The Bible says, and we are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey Him. So if you've obeyed Him, you've been given the Holy Spirit. Again in Romans 5 and verse 5, the Spirit said to be given. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. There it is again, it's given to us. The Bible teaches if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us, we don't belong to God. We're none of His. And that's Romans 8, read with me, verse 9 to 11. The Bible says, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sins, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised, up, that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He also that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. How could anything be more plain than that? Several times in that passage it's mentioned that we have the Holy Spirit in us. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, Paul said, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? And he goes on to say, For you are bought with a price. So we're told here that we have the Holy Spirit in us, that we are the temple for that Spirit. 
And then we're told that the earnest of the Spirit's given to us in 2 Corinthians 1, and I'll talk more about this earnest a little bit later in the study, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20 and 21. You know, David could tell us a lot about earnest money and about how when you buy properties, for example, that a down payment is made. And what it is is a pledge that you will ultimately pay for that, for that uh, purchase altogether. It's a down payment, a guarantee, uh, whereby you promise to pay that debt. Well, the Holy Spirit is God's down payment to us on a whole inheritance, an everlasting inheritance that He's going to give us one day. And imagine the Holy Spirit just being the down payment. We're talking about a member of the Godhead. And so we're given a member of the Godhead to dwell in us as a down payment of what we're ultimately going to receive. And that's what this earnest is talking about here. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us as God, who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So there again it is. We're sealed with the Spirit. We've been given the earnest of the Spirit. And then in Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, we're told that we're sealed by the Spirit. Again, I'll talk to you more later about what it means to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, we're told here, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the, re unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So we are sealed then with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given us as an earnest. Now look at that list of scriptures. I gave you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least seven scriptures, all telling us that we have the Holy Spirit in us. And I don't know how the Bible could say that a whole lot plainer. If you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit in you. Now there are different ideas about how the Spirit dwells. Some think that the Holy Spirit dwells through faith, that He doesn't dwell literally in us, that He simply dwells through our faith. Others think that the Holy Spirit dwells in us representatively through the Word. Others believe the Holy Spirit dwells in us literally. And I never do argue with people about how they believe the indwelling occurs. As long as you believe you have the Holy Spirit, I leave people alone. They can sort it out with what they believe the Scripture teaches on the indwelling. But the Bible mentions the Holy Spirit as a gift, and there's no question that each and every Christian has that. Now that gift of the Holy Spirit is either a gift that the Holy Spirit gives, or it is the gift of the Spirit itself, and I'm more inclined to think the latter. You know, the gift of $100 is $100. To me, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, and when you connect it, especially with these verses telling us that we have the Spirit in us, I don't have a problem with that as long as a person doesn't believe that that Spirit is giving them miraculous abilities and powers that have not been promised to you and I today as Christians. That's the danger of, of it, you see, and that's what we need to be careful about. Now, the question then arises in connection with that, is the Holy Spirit going to allow you and I, because we have it, will He allow you and I to do miracles? The answer is no. And I know people think that they're able to do things, that they can cast devils out and such things. You know, I don't see them doing tangible things that you can witness. You ever seen anybody walk on water? Have you ever seen anybody curse a tree and it wither away? Ever seen anyone raise the dead? Do you ever see any things like Jesus did, like the apostles did? You see, we don't see miracles like that. Who takes food and multiplies it and feeds four or 5,000 people? 
And why don't people do these kind of things? The simple truth is they can't. If they could, they would. And it's not that God doesn't have the power to supply that. The same God that gave Christ that power, the same God that gave the apostles this power, the same God that gave early Christians this power, still has that power today. It's not a matter of His power, folks. It's a matter of His will. What's He will to do? And He just simply hasn't willed to give these things to me. And now, you and I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're commanded to. Do you realize you've got a commandment to be filled with the Holy Spirit? But you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and never do a miracle. John the Baptist was that way. I want you to look at Luke 1 and verse 15 with me. Luke 1, 15 there. Zacharias, John's father, was given this word about John's birth. And he's told here that he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now tell me what miracle John worked. In John 10 and verse 41, here's what the Bible says. Many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. John the Baptist really never did a miracle. Yet he's filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. And that's the point I want you to see. We can be filled with the Spirit and never work a miracle. John was. And Jesus said there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist among those born among women. And he's talking about a greater prophet. And so now we, we have that connection. A Christian's commanded, as I told you earlier, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19, here it is. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there's a commandment right there that, that let the Word of Christ dwell in you uh, that we'll read about in Colossians. is the same up here in Ephesians 5. He's saying, be filled with the Spirit. In other words, you is the understood subject in that. You be filled with the Spirit is what he commands here. So you and I have a commandment to be filled with the Spirit. He said, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Now look at uh, Colossians 3.16 because he shows us how that filling can take place. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In Ephesians 5, which is the parallel and companion passage to Colossians 3.16, we're told to be filled with the Spirit. Then in Colossians 3.16, we're told to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. When we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, the Holy Spirit is filling us because He's working through this Word, you see. And we're just getting filled with the Spirit. The Word is not the Spirit, but you can be filled with the Spirit by letting that Word dwell in you richly. You're guided by the Spirit. You're filled with the Spirit. You're led by the Spirit. You're influenced by the Spirit. You see, all of that's going on when you let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's the same as Ephesians 5, be ye filled with the Spirit. Both are parallel. Now, does the Spirit operate apart from the Word? I raised that question when we started the study today. Is the Holy Spirit gonna, gonna work on you apart from this word right here. There are a lot of people that say, yes, Calvinism teaches a direct operation and influence of the Holy Spirit. 
The doctrine of Calvin taught that the Holy Spirit, in fact, you can't be converted. It's called irresistible grace. It's one of the five doctrines of Calvinism. Remember that word tulip? We studied it. How each one of the letters in that word represents one of five doctrines taught by Calvin. Total hereditary depravity, that's the T. Um, unconditional election, the U. Limited atonement was the L. The I was irresistible grace. And the P was perseverance of the saints. We've studied those five doctrines, haven't we? And that irresistible grace, they believe, is a direct operation of the Spirit where the Spirit comes and enters into you directly and works in your heart miraculously, mysteriously, bringing about a change and a conversion that you can't resist. And Calvinism teaches that whether you want to be a child of God or not, the effectual call of the Holy Spirit can never be resisted. It always accomplishes its purpose. And so when God sends the Holy Spirit apart from the Word, to operate on the heart of a sinner, that sinner will be converted according to Calvinism. And that's just false. You see, if the Holy Spirit operates separate and apart from the Word in conversion, why was Philip, ask yourself in Acts 8, why was Philip told by an angel, Arise, verse 26, go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And when he got down on the road, there's an Ethiopian man. And Philip was sent down there to deliver him the word. Now, why didn't the Holy Spirit go do that? Philip's having a great work up in Samaria. He's in a populated area. Now the angel's directing him to go to a barren wilderness. But why doesn't the Holy Spirit go do that? He can be there in an instant. Philip's got to travel. He may need lodging. He may have to stop and buy bread. And then he's got to come back up out of there. And of course, he was miraculously transported out. But nonetheless, if the Spirit operates directly or apart from the Word, he could have gone and done that and there was no need. Remember Cornelius up in Caesarea sent down the seacoast to Joppa to fetch Peter. Why didn't the Holy Spirit just come and convert Cornelius and his household directly? If Calvinism is right and if the Spirit operates apart from the Word. You see, Cornelius needed to hear the Word. He needed a preacher. And I don't have this scripture on the chart, but let me remind you something in, in Romans that we've read many, many times. Paul raised some questions there. I believe it's Romans 10. And he says there in around verse 13 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he said this, How then shall they call upon him in whom they've not believed? So he talks about calling, being saved. Then he starts raising questions. How are they going to call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So the process in salvation, in being saved, we send preachers. They preach and people hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, so they believe. Then they're able to call upon the name of the Lord, and we know that's in baptism, and they reach salvation. But it starts with the sending out of preachers, because the Spirit's not going to operate apart from this Word. See the process right here. Paul just lays it out. Paul is a preacher. Why is he traveling the Roman Empire? making all these journeys in peril and sacrificing his life in danger. Let the Holy Spirit go throughout the Roman Empire and convert people directly, you see, but he doesn't operate that way. He operates through the Word, and we're not limiting the Holy Spirit. This is how God chose to do it. God could have sent the Holy Spirit directly. 
God could have sent angels out. He's got millions of them. And they could cover this earth in just a very short period of time. Everyone on earth would hear the gospel that way. Why doesn't God do it? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. God put this treasure, the gospel, in earthen vessels like me and you. And this is who He wants to use to carry this word to the human race. That's why Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why Christ said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It's because that's how the Holy Spirit converts people. He uses the Word. The Holy Spirit is not the Word, but He uses this Word in bringing about conversion. This Word is called His sword. In Ephesians 6, 17, read with me. Ephesians 6, 17, Paul, when he talks about uh, the Christian armor, he says, And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the Spirit's sword is the Word. And He pricks our hearts with that Word. That's His sword. And when that Word is preached, that's the Holy Spirit working, and He's bringing changes in us to bring about our conversion. You see, when that, hope, when, when that Word is preached, we preach Jesus, don't we? What happens? The Holy Spirit tells us about Christ. What does that do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. That's the Holy Spirit giving us faith. And the only difference is He's not doing that directly. He's just using the Word. The Holy Spirit brings about our repentance because when we preach this book, what do we tell people? Repent. And how's repentance brought about? Godly sorrow works repentance. We preach the goodness of God. Paul would say in Romans 2 and 4, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When we tell sinners about God's love, when we preach Christ to them, we're telling about the goodness of God, and the goodness of God is what leads them to repentance. What else do we preach when we preach this word? We warn of judgment. Didn't Paul say to the men of Athens in Acts 17, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. See, He preached repentance. Why? Because He's appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, and that He hath raised Him from the dead. We tell people about God's goodness, and we warn them of wrath to come. And the goodness of God and the fear of judgment produces in them a godly sorrow for what they've done that changes and works repentance in them. And that's the Holy Spirit bringing that change. He's just doing it through the Word we preach. Do we understand that principle? It's not that the Spirit's not working. He is working. And He's not going to work until we preach this Word because He does not operate apart from it. It's His sword. And in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This Word is powerful. The Bible says it's quick. That means it's living. This Word is alive. You know, one Sunday years ago, I was speaking at a decoration, at a memorial service at a cemetery over in Madison County, David, on what, what we call Bohannon Mountain. You've probably heard of it. <coughs> C.J. Jackson there at Aurora was supposed to speak that Sunday and represent the Church of Christ, and he had to take his mother over to Fayetteville to the National Cemetery because C.J.'s brother had been killed in World War II, and Grace wanted to go to the, the grave over there in Fayetteville, and that kept C.J. From, from taking this appointment. He asked me if I would go in his place, and I agreed. I went up on Bohannon to this little church building that sat by a cemetery, 
And uh, they had several speakers that day, several preachers had been asked to talk, and I was one of them. And there was a fellow in front of me that uh, believed in the Spirit operating apart from this Word, and he got up, he held up the Bible, he said, folks, this is just an old dead letter. He said, I'm just going to tell you today what the Lord lays on my heart. And I want you, I wish you could have heard what the Lord laid on his heart or what he blamed the Lord for. He was ill prepared, not organized, had nothing to say to the audience, just got up and rambled. It wasn't the Holy Spirit leading this guy. He didn't have anything to say. He threw away what he should have said and got up and claimed the Holy Spirit was leading him and just made a mess of his talk. Well, that bothered me. <laughs> I'll tell you frankly, it did. So I got up behind him, it was my turn, and I said, folks, I'm just going to say what the Holy Spirit lays on my heart today. And he lays on my heart a lot of things through this word. And I quoted some scripture where Jesus said in John 6, verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And I talked about how this word is alive. I went over to Peter's words in 1 Peter 1, verse 22, 23, where he said, seeing you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And I talked about how this word is alive. And quoted like Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick or living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I said, I'm just going to preach what the Spirit lays on my heart today. And of course I had studied, since it was Memorial Day, it was a cemetery next to the building here, people had come to decorate the graves of their loved ones. I talked on the resurrection of Christ. Evidence for that resurrection and why we have hope because of Jesus' resurrection. You see, the Holy Spirit revealed that to me through Scripture. And when I got up and preached it that day, don't you see, I was preaching what the Spirit gave me. Right here. I was led by the Spirit. And that message was well received that day. Folks were amening and they were, uh, they were emotional in nature, so they clapped and, and uh, everything else. You know, it was a pretty rambunctious crowd because they were holiness Pentecostal type. And so uh, I had a lot of response in return, but it was very interesting. People are hungry for the Word. They're hungry for the Spirit. And don't realize that the Spirit's going to operate through this Word. Many of them are turning away from the Word in favor of emotional experiences, of things in which they believe the Holy Spirit's leading them when He's not leading them at all. They're having emotional experiences of things that have already been taught to them or a motivational talk that's been made. And so you can get stirred up and carried away with that and attribute things to the Holy Spirit that He's simply not doing directly. Folks, the Holy Spirit speaks through this Word and He, he did that. You see it in the prophets of the Old Testament. Read with me there Second Peter 1 verse 20, 21, and let's read some scripture about this, how the Spirit speaks. He spoke with the prophets. Peter said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of God, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See it? Those holy men back there, those prophets spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and that was the Spirit speaking. David said in 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and His Word was in my tongue. See that? 
the Spirit spake by David. And when you heard David, that was the Holy Spirit speaking. David said, His word was in my tongue. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 30. Yet many years didst thou forbear them and testified against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest them into the hand of the people of the lands. So you see, he, he forbear, he testified against them by his spirit in his prophets. And those Old Testament prophets, when they warned God's people back there, you see, that was God speaking to them. And yet, Nehemiah says they didn't hear. When they stoned Stephen over in Acts 7, Peter accused the Jews of resisting the Holy Spirit. Listen, by resist, or excuse me, Stephen accused the Jews of resisting the Holy Spirit by resisting his words. What he was saying. The prophets, quoting the prophets. Let's read Acts 7, verse 51 and 52. Before they stoned Stephen, here's what he said to them. He said, You stick necked, stick necked, and uncircumcised in hearted ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Now look at that. He said, You're resisting the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have your fathers? Have not your fathers persecuted? and slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom now ye have been the betrayers and murderers." He said that, uh, he said, you're resisting the Spirit just like your fathers did. Which prophet didn't the fathers persecute? Your forefathers persecuted the prophets, all right? What did they do when they persecuted prophets? Resisted the Spirit, because the Spirit was in those prophets. What did they do when they slew those that were sent to them? Resisted the Spirit. And so he goes on to tell them, you've betrayed Jesus and been his murderer even that God sent to you. And so this is called resisting the Spirit when you resist the words of the prophets back there. Exactly what he hung on them that day. The Holy Spirit speaks through this word. Look at Revelation 3. There's just any number of scriptures on this. Revelation 3, verse 6, verse 13, verse 22 all say the same thing. John would, would write a letter to the seven churches of Asia, and down on the end he put, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now how was the Spirit talking to those churches? through the revelation that John wrote. He tells them again there in verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so when you read the book of Revelation, you're hearing what the Spirit says to the churches. See how that makes sense? That's the Spirit speaking as if He were here in our midst and talking verbally. Because that's what He uses. That's His sword. That's His instrument. David, um, actually I should say the Holy Spirit through David predicted that Judas would betray Christ. Did you know the Spirit said that? When David wrote that, that was the Spirit making that prediction. And Peter on the day of Pentecost referred to that. Now I don't have the scripture listed here, but if you'll look at point C under point three, you'll see there under the first uh, point that the Spirit spoke of Judas by David. You'll see Psalm 69, 25, and Psalm 109, 109.8. And when you read those two Psalms, Peter combined them together. David wrote them. Peter put them together in Acts 1 and quoted them, the combination of them, to show that the Holy Spirit through David spoke about Judas. And uh, Acts 1 now, let's read verse 15 to 20. You'll see Peter lay this out. Peter's going to quote now David 
here in Psalm 69 and in Psalm 108. Here it is. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning, concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling uh, headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem insomuch that that field is called in their proper tongue a keldama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, and here it is. Here's the quote now from David. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric, or his office, let another take. That's what David wrote. That's what the Holy Spirit said about <laughs> Judas. And, and Peter says that David, that the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spoke this con before concerning Judas. Now see, that was the Holy Spirit speaking. How did he speak? Through David and what David wrote. See that? Nothing direct about that. He uses the Word. That's how he operates. And folks, he does that through the Word in bringing about the new birth. When all of you were born again, when all of you uh, were saved, when you became Christians, the Holy Spirit did that. Not a person here is saved without the Holy Spirit. None of us. Not a person here is saved without being born of the Holy Spirit. The issue is not whether the Holy Spirit saves us. The issue is not whether we're born of the Spirit. The issue is how are we born of the Spirit? Because everybody has to be. Jesus said, except you be born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. And so he put that pretty plainly to us there, didn't he, in John chapter 3. Well, we're born of the Holy Spirit when we obey the Word. The Spirit uses the Word to bring about our new birth through the preaching of the Word. Let's read some Scripture. 1 Corinthians 4.15, and let me make this illustration. You've seen me do it before. I want my left hand here to represent the heart of man because the Holy Spirit's got to operate on the heart of man to bring about salvation. My right hand will be the Holy Spirit. There's two ways the Spirit can operate on my heart. He can do it directly, like the Calvinist teaches. Or He can use an instrument, like the Word, to reach my heart, like the Bible says either directly or indirectly. How is it? It's indirectly. This is the sword of the Spirit, and this is what He uses to bring about the new birth. You know, when a doctor operates on you, he has an instrument, doesn't he? Thankfully, he doesn't rip our flesh open where he can get inside and operate in there. He's got a little sharp instrument, don't he? where he makes his incision. The instrument is not the doctor. The doctor's still doing the operation. He's just got an instrument. He's not doing it directly. He's doing, his, using, doing it indirectly through that instrument. The Holy Spirit is operating on us and bringing about our salvation. He's just using an instrument. And there's the difference. Now let's read Scripture. 1 Corinthians 4.15. Paul had started the church at Corinth, and he called himself his father. He saw himself as being a father to them spiritually. He said, For though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. In Christ Jesus, I've begotten you. You're born, I've begotten you through the gospel. 
See what he used? Then again, we're told in James 1 in verse 18 that we're begotten by the Word. James says, of his own will begat he us with the Word of truth. There it is again. Now notice Peter, he put it a lot more plainly in, in 1 Peter 1, verse 21 and 22. Peter said, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. There it is. We purify our soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we're begotten or born again by the Word of God. And it lives and abides forever. It's, it's living. It's eternal. Okay? And that's what the Spirit uses. He influences us through the Word. You see it on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. Remember Acts 2 and verse 40, 41? The Bible says of Peter, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So he used the, the word that day. Jesus taught about that in the parable of the sower. Remember that one? Remember how the Lord told of a, of a sower? He said, a sower went out to sow his seed, and some of the seed fell by the wayside. Some of it, he said, fell on, on stony ground, on a rock. And it sprang up and withered away. It lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked it. It became unfruitful. Other fell on good ground and brought forth fruit a hundredfold. And they wanted to know the meaning of that parable. So he begins to tell them here. Read with me from Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus said, Now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the Word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. Now folks, look at that. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the Word out of their hearts. Why? lest they should believe and be saved, because that word in that heart is going to produce faith that will save them. And the devil knows this. And if he can confuse people on the word and steal the word from them, he robs them of salvation. And that wayside soil, you see, wouldn't take in that word and lost it, just like the fowls of the air came along and devoured it. That's Satan stealing it. He goes on and talks about the other cases here. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. We see that all the time. We see people that obey the gospel, Sometimes they're in our midst and all of a sudden we turn around and they're gone. Temptation, persecution, affliction, uh, offenses, different things come along and take them away. And they're just like the, the, the word there that fell on that rock and they don't have enough root. They're not deeply rooted to stay faithful to the Lord during trials that come along in their life. You know, we think back on Brother Zach. Look at, look at what all Zach endured. Tornado blows his house away. He comes down with cancer. He loses his job. Can't drive his truck anymore. His wife dies. Nobody got worked over more than Zach did the last two or three years four years. But he was faithful because he was deeply rooted, wasn't he? And so he still lives here among us. His, his legacy still remains. And uh, he was not like the one on the rock here. Then he talked about others that were on the thorn. Let's read that. 
that which fell among thorns are they which when they've heard go forth and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So you see cares, anxieties, worries, uh, things like this, pleasures of this life, riches, all of that will take us away. We can get caught up in material things like this to where we lose our, our soul because we don't have any fruit. We got to keep our priorities straight. Finally, he said, that on good ground are they which when they hear, he says they, they have an honest and good heart, they keep the word and bring forth fruit with patience. You, you bear fruit for the Lord by keeping this word. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. And what is it? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of this fruit of the Spirit is produced through this word. And when we keep that word, we have those fruitful things in our life. You look at a person that keeps the word, they've got goodness. See, they're a good person. They've got love, joy, they've got peace, long-suffering. These are people that are long-suffering, not quick-tempered, because that's the Spirit producing it through that Word. Now, I've said that the Spirit uh, influences through this Word. If He doesn't give us miraculous powers, and He doesn't, and we've proven that, What's He doing in us? Why do we have Him? And I'm going to give you three different things, at least three. Number one, the Spirit seals us as belonging to Christ. He stamps us as being legitimate children. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about being sealed with the Spirit. <coughs> I want you to think of a stamp, of a notary seal, of a stamp of some kind that we seal things with. You see, they're authentic then, they're legitimate, they're authoritative. And when you and I become Christians, we are given the Holy Spirit and He seals us. He stamps us as belonging to God. All of God's children have this stamp. And what is that seal? They have the Spirit. The Bible teaches that in many places. Let's read Ephesians 1.13. Paul said, in whom also you believe, you trusted that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we're sealed by the Spirit. We're told in Ephesians 4 verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. That day of redemption is the resurrection of our body. We're sealed by the Spirit under the day of redemption. And then, Romans 8, verse 9 to 11. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He also that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit which dwelleth in you. So he says, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. That's that sealing he's talking about, that stamp, that we are legitimate children of God. Every child of God will have the Holy Spirit. That's one reason he's there. Secondly, the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. As I said earlier, He's the down payment on everything God's ultimately going to give us. He's the pledge. He's the earnest. Let's read Scripture here. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and 22, <clears throat> 
2 Corinthians 1, verse 21, 22. I need to get the right page here. Excuse me just a minute. I do have it. Okay. Now he which established us with you is Christ and hath anointed us as God who hath also sealed us. Now notice. And given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He sealed us. He gave the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Again, another scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Ephesians 1, now more plainly, verse 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The Spirit seals us. It's the earnest of our inheritance. It's the guarantee. You see, God says, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit as my guarantee that I ultimately will redeem your body. I've redeemed your soul. I will ultimately redeem your body. And He'll do that at the resurrection. And that Spirit in us is what's going to bring about our resurrection. Because the Bible there we read in Romans 8 says, If he that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he also that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So your mortal body, this body, body that's subject to death, will be quickened by that Spirit that's in you. And so he becomes the earnest, the guarantee, that God ultimately will redeem our, us entirely. We're waiting, we're waiting right now for the redemption of our body. We have the redemption of our soul. Our bodies have not been redeemed. That full, completed redemption has not occurred. That occurs at the resurrection. And uh, God may own the body, but it's not been fully redeemed. He's, he's made the down payment on it. It's His. You make a down payment on a car, you drive it off the lot. But you don't have ownership yet till you pay that note <laughs> in full. That's what God ultimately will do. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That spirit becomes the earnest, His pledge that He will ultimately redeem us. And then number three, the Spirit seals us. The Spirit is our earnest of our inheritance. The Spirit also makes intercession to God for us. So we've got somebody praying to God, interceding for us continually, called the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is doing that too. See, the whole Godhead's working in our behalf. We've, we've got all that in our favor. Christ is our high priest. He's there in the presence of His Father. He makes intercession. So does the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. How many of you have prayed and about all you could do was groan? Didn't have the words. Your spirit was just burdened. You're just troubled. And you really, you know, you just really don't know what to say next. I, I've actually told the Lord before in prayer, Lord, I don't know what to ask for here. I've had this request, uh, this has come up. I don't know. I don't know what I need. I don't know what's best here, but you do. And I'll, may, I may say something like, I know Christ intercedes and I know the Spirit does. And may they, you know, may they give you the words. I don't have them. The Spirit intercedes for us. He makes intercessions with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He makes intercession to God for us. Notice he doesn't do this to us. He makes intercession to God for us. 
in our behalf. It's not something he does to us, but for us. There's a big difference there. Okay? So three things then. He is, he seals us. He's the earnest of our inheritance. He makes intercession for us. We're told in 1 Corinthians 6, our body is the temple for the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And then we're told in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22, that this, we're built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. In other words, God dwells in us through the Spirit. We're His temple. We're His sanctuary. And that's another reason we have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. You and I are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. This is His temple here today. Right here is where He inhabits. This is what He dwells in. I hope the study has been helpful to us today. These are some things about the indwelling and the operation of the Spirit that I, I hope we'll always keep in mind. If we'll do that, we won't get carried away, as the Bible says, by every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. We're warned against that. So I leave you with those, with those thoughts today. I hope it's been beneficial to you. As we usually do, our custom is, let's have an invitation, a song. If, if someone should need the Lord this morning, we certainly want to invite you to come forward, make that known. If you've got needs, burdens, sin, things that you need prayer about. If you'd like to become a Christian, if you'd like to be baptized, we'd certainly be willing to have you come and confess your faith in Christ and we'll take you within the hour and baptize you for the remission of sins. Please, please rise with me and anyone that needs Christ, come forward and be seated as we sing. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.